You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 115 of the Common Descent Podcast. 115. Today we're talking about biome. Yeah. If you're new to the podcast, we talk about paleontology, evolution, life history, and every episode we have a topic that we look at from that lens. And episodes that end in five are a tradition. It used to be extinction episodes. Yup. These days, it's plants. And as it turns out, biomes are a major plant-related topic. Yeah, plants are kind of a big deal when it comes to talking about biomes. They sure are. They kind of define the biomes in a lot of ways. We're going to talk about what biomes are, why they're important, how we identify biomes, right? The regions of different biological features on the planet. And of course, how we study them in the past, how we identify them in the past, and how biomes have come and gone over time. Yeah. But of course, part of this tradition is us recognizing and acknowledging that we don't know anything about plants. So... As is tradition with our plant episodes, we will be joined after the first break by our friend, Dr. Allie Baumgartner. Yeah! We are very excited for Allie to teach us all about plants. Actually, we're excited for you to hear it. We've already recorded that part. Yes, we already learned about plants. We already know a lot about biomes, but we'll, we'll, we'll send it over to that. This episode topic was requested, which is another tradition on the podcast, this time by Sam, also by... Dr. Ali Baumgartner. <laughs> yes, she said this is something we should talk about. She said she wanted to do a biomes episode. And we had a request from Patrick for an Ali's Choice episode, who said that they want Ali to choose something because surely she can think of good ideas. And as it turns out, Ali had chosen something, so that counts for this episode. Nice. <laughs> now, before we get into the meat of the episode, a few quick announcements. Number one, we have a Patreon. We do. Patreon is an avenue for our listeners to support us financially. The podcast is run entirely on funds that come in from Patreon. It allows us to host the podcast, to get nice equipment, our microphones, our headsets, our stuff like that. We're purchased with Patreon money. Thank you very much. Patreons get all sorts of goodies, bonus content, extra audios, things like that. And if you are a patron subscribed at a certain level, we will shout your name out in gratitude here on the podcast. We will. This episode, we would like to welcome Claudia, Patrick, Gary, Jacob, Tobias, Meep, and Renee Lynn and Cade. Wow, thanks everyone and welcome. Thank you to everyone for supporting us in these wacky times that we're in. We're happy that we are still a priority for you. <laughs> it's, it's so awesome. It's very cool. Hey, speaking of bonus content, even outside of Patreon, we do some bonus stuff every now and then. Yeah, some outside the episode things. And it is June. And what June means, or it has meant for a while now, is that we like to think about movies in June. Yeah, a little bit more than usual. Uh, yep, just it's the <laughs> summer blockbuster feel or something. <laughs> in the past, we have done series of silver screen science. In June, we did Jurassic Park series in June. We did Kai June. Yeah. A couple of years ago. This June, we are bringing Silver Screen Science back for a double feature centering around topics that our listeners have been asking us when we're going to do it. Silver Screen Science about Crocs and Snakes. Yeah, Crocs versus Snakes. Specifically, later this month, after the release of this episode, we will be releasing two parts Silver Screen Science series talking about Lake Placid, Woo! which has Crocs in it, and Anaconda. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you big jerk. So stay tuned for those. Keep your eyes on the podcast feed. Those will be fun to discuss. And if you're a patron, we release extra more thoughts episodes for patrons. So we can be all snooty about movies. That's right. It's where we pretend to be movie critics. <laughs> we pretend to know what we're talking about. Uh, also, June is Pride Month. Yes, it is. Happy Pride, everybody. Happy Pride, everyone. So to all of our listeners out there, wherever you fall on the vast spectrum of sexual and gender identities... We hope you're having a good summer. Yeah. Stay strong. Be proud. And with that, let's move into the first major section of our episode, the news. Every episode, we like to pick some news that is new in the world of paleontology and related studies. 
and share our uh, what we understand of them, what we think of them, for you. Keeps everybody up to date. Will, please start us off with some news. Okie dokie. I have some news that's about a potential mass shark extinction in the Miocene. Ooh. Okay, in the past. Yes. Good. Not like an upcoming mass shark no, extinction. No, that's... Uh, well, that too. <laughs> that's That's less... Potential that's uh, <laughs> happening. Well, now it's a sad episode. <sighs> I was so excited about this news. <laughs> Tell us about this news. This is research by Catalina Pimiento and Nicholas Pienson in Science. And the article we'll be linking to in the blog post, there's a blog post, is by Yasmin Saplikoglu in Live Science. So, this research is about the fact that according to some very small shark fossils, there seems to be a major dip in shark population and diversity around 19 million years ago. Oh, early Miocene. Early Miocene. Now, this is an extreme dip, and it's something that's kind of new. Like, this isn't something we've been talking about. This seems to be a new understanding of shark populations throughout history. Hmm. So it's it's a very new research. There's lots of extra research that will need to be done to confirm this. I want to say that beforehand. Because these numbers are pretty crazy. <laughs> so this research is focused on very tiny fossils called ichthyoliths, which are typically consisted of like itty bitty scales and teeth from fish and sharks. Okay. Uh, we got a question a while back of if shark denticles fossilize. Yep. Ichthyoliths. They sure do. This is what they refer to, but <laughs> they are not well studied. Uh, or at least they were for a while, like the 70s and 80s they were studied, and then there evidently has not been much research on them since then. Uh, we're bringing ichthyoliths back. And that's what this research was saying, is they're often overlooked, and they're found in sediment cores from ocean sediment. Right. I assume this is like studying, you know, pollen. Yes. <laughs> it's like, this is very, very small stuff. That's what they made it sound like. And when they looked at the ichthyoliths, they had noticed that... In previous cores, shark ichthyoliths seemed to decline around 19 million years ago. Hmm. But it had never been, like, really defined or heavily noted from the sound of things. Right. So they took a closer look. They analyzed previous sediment cores from two different sites, one in the North Pacific and one in the South Pacific. They picked these sites because they were particularly far from land and that hopefully this would make them more stable, and so that the dip in ichthyoliths would not be due to currents changing or weather patterns or something from local continents and land masses to try to make sure that any changes we saw were due to population dynamics, not things just being shifted around. Only the South Pacific site actually covered the 19 million year date, uh, but the other one does have fossils from either side of it, from 35 to 22 million years, and then 12 to 11, so they can get a before-after image. Right. Altogether a long span. Yes. They extracted the ichthyoliths from the sediment cores, examined them, and both looking at the at the 19 million year dateline and before and after shots, they came to the conclusion that shark fossils, these ichthyoliths, dropped by about 90% Wow. around 19 million years ago. Wow. And that there was a notable difference before and after. So this is like a major shark extinction if this is accurate. Yeah. Just all the, the sharks, either that or sharks stopped dropping pieces of themselves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now they wanted to figure out, is this truly an extinction? Does this seem like it was actually affecting shark diversity? So they categorized. They classified 798 denticles from the South Pacific core and 465 from the North Pacific core into 80 different morphologies, so shapes of scales. Right. And they found that in that 90% dip in number, 70% of the denticle types disappeared. Right. So not just numbers dropped, but also the diversity. Yes. Of the, the different types and shapes of the scales. Now this is, once again, early evidence. Like right. this, this is, is one site. One, a couple of cores... Only one of them is actually from the date, so there are researchers who've stepped forward to be like, mm. right. There could be other reasons that you're seeing a dip. You only have a couple sites. Only one of it is actually hitting the time that the extinction might be happening. Mm -hmm. But if this is an extinction, it would be huge for ocean dynamics. Yeah. Not only because you're 
losing a bunch of predatory animals, which affects ecosystem stability and dynamics. But for at least shark fossil record wise, this would be a huge change in what had been about 45 million years of stability. Right. Shark numbers had been doing pretty fine since the end Cretaceous 66 million years ago. And then suddenly there would be this giant drop off for over 40 million years later. And that would mean a huge change in how the ocean's working. Right. Now, as for what caused it, no clue. Yeah. It sounds like no one has really studied this possible event. Yes. So it could be a number of things. Uh, There's no clear environmental driver, you know, cause that syncs up with that time to point at and go, oh, oh, that makes sense. There doesn't seem anything obvious. Right. It's not like when you go, oh, there was an extinction. That makes sense because this big volcano went off mm-hmm. at that time or whatever. It's giant igneous providence. Yeah, that's, that's the one. They all say probably not like a shift in the predatory dynamics, you know, that caused it because a lot of the things that you might blame that on didn't evolve until several million years later. So like, like big uh, pr- predaceous whales. Yeah. And like or that. they list things like tuna and beaked whales and stuff like that, that gotcha. would have served as competition for sharks did not sync up with this a lot of their uh uh, coming about in the fossil record so we don't know what caused it so really this is the tip of what may be a extinction iceberg that needs more research to confirm or deny this is a cool finding because regardless of what it turns out to be it's going to be important and interesting Mm -hmm. like you don't get a 90 percent drop in your shark numbers Uh, you know the fossil remains you're finding and a huge decline in diversity, even if it turns out to just be like, yeah, no, this site wasn't preserving them yeah. or something. Like, or it was a if, localized event. Right. E- even if there was no event, even mm-hmm. if this is just about fossilization, that's still a really significant difference. So whether this was a local event or a global event or a false event, mm-hmm. that's a cool site to look into more. That, that's, that's a weird pattern to find in the fossil record. There's got to be some interesting info there. Well, speaking of long spans of time with interesting fossil records. That's my, mostly what we talk about. That is true. My <laughs> next bit of news <laughs> is about Moa poop. Oh, I like that. This is research that provides a, not the first, but the first major insight into the diet of the little bush Moa. Aww. Yeah. This is research by Jamie Wood et al. in Quaternary Science Reviews, and we will link in the blog post to a press release in Sci News. Moas were, they are not around anymore, real big herbivorous birds that lived across New Zealand Mm -hmm. up until, you know, we showed up and uh, dealt with that. Nom, 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 nom. I say they're big birds. These are among the largest birds ever. Yeah. At least the biggest ones. Yes. Like, most massive. We know quite a bit about the diets of New Zealand moas, but mostly just from three species, and there were about nine species. Most of what we know comes from the South Island giant moa, the heavy-footed moa, and the upland moa. About 90% of known coprolites, that is, fossilized poop, episode 30, come from those three species. The other species, we don't know very much about their poops, and thus about their diets. This study reports a series of coprolites from little bush moas, species Anomalopteryx didiformis. That's a good name. It's such a good name. Anomalopteryx? Anomalopteryx didiformis. That's a great name. According to a quick Google search, which is to say Wikipedia, these are the smallest known moas, and they are only about turkey-sized. All right. I, I was wondering what the smallest moa would be, if that would be, like, only a couple feet tall, or, like... Right, if it's if it's like yeah, only the size of an emu, yeah, no, no. like a the size of a bird. Well, it's like when we're talking <laughs> about like bird. small pachyderms. It's yeah, no, that's right. that's actually a pretty small <laughs> moa. Previously, the new set of coprolites from these little moas comes from a rock shelter deposit in Fiordland National Park in the southwest corner of the South Island of New Zealand. They were identified as belonging to this species based on their uh, DNA tested from the material awesome. and. They match up with the distribution of this species, so it makes sense. Before this, according to the research, only five coprolites of little bush moas were known, all from a different area. This site records coprolite samples 
spanning from 6,800 to 4,600 years ago. All right. 2,000 years of little bush moa poops. That's one big pile of poop. (laughs) It sure is. (laughs) This is apparently the longest known temporal span of moa coprolites and the southernmost site with moa coprolites. I love... I. I like every now and then when we get news and they make comments like that because it feels like those really weird Guinness World Record records. <laughs> yeah, it's like the long like I we the, talked the, the longest a person has ever held a spoon. Yeah, we talked about it at school today. One person was like, "Well, one school made the record for the longest Domino's using cereal boxes." I'm like, oh, "Of course they did." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. They, they beat the three other people competing. <laughs> the the so, one yeah. time it accidentally <laughs> happened on top of my fridge. <laughs> So this is a long span of time covered by these coprolites from a place where we don't get a lot of coprolites from a species we don't have a lot of coprolites from. Some much-needed poop. And inside the much-needed poop were lots of plants. Pollen, leaf remains, both macro fossils and also, I believe, like, cuticle remains. The researchers were able to identify them morphologically, but also the DNA of the plants to get a sense of the variety of plants these moas were eating. Big picture-wise, these results support previous hypotheses that these birds were browsing on trees and shrubs in the understory. So, hey, we were right about that. The plants themselves seem to track a transitional time in the forest, where the canopy was changing. So where it started out dominated by conifers transitioning to a time period where it was dominated by silver beech. So the poops tell us what the forest was doing over time. And there were some surprises in the poops. For one, they had very few seeds in there. Weird. Other moas, apparently, often have poops full of seeds, which suggests that they were important seed dispersers, right? You eat a plant over here, you take a hike, and then you poop and you move the plant somewhere else. So it could be that little bush moas were not dispersing seeds. Uh, It was suggested in the the press release, I believe this was, that they might have been eating conifer seeds that were fully ground up in the gizzard. Okay, yeah. They didn't make it to the hind end. They weren't surviving digestion. Which suggests that these little bush moas were not important for seed dispersal. But the other surprise was that their coprolites had lots of ferns. Hmm. This is new evidence that these moas were eating lots of ferns, which suggests that while they were not apparently important for seed dispersal, they might have been very important for spore dispersal. That the while the bigger moas might have been how trees and other seeding plants were getting the, their progeny around, the little moas might have been important for ferns dispersing around New Zealand forests. Interesting. That's, I, I've i never, when I think of herbivorous birds, I tend to think of seed eaters and fruit eaters. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know there are grazers, like I think geese will eat grass and stuff like like and other birds like that will actually graze. Uh, but I don't think of browsing birds very often. Right. So like the idea of a bird eating ferns yeah. is a surprisingly <laughs> alien Having idea. A salad. I mean... Moas are a surprisingly alien. Yeah, <laughs> which is very true, but it's just, that's weird. I yeah. love it. And spore dispersers, that makes so much sense. But once again, I, I, I've i never heard that term, so that's that's a new concept that I yeah. like. This is one of those cool studies where, yeah, we found a bunch of poops, and they they honestly tell us in some ways more about the forest than they tell us about the birds that they came from, Mm -hmm. which is a very cool uh, proxy for this information. Yeah. It's, it's always interesting when you find something, you know, from an animal or about an animal that also ends up being surprisingly informative about a secondary topic. Right. Because this wasn't really about the moas. This was about the moas providing us convenient collections of plant material in nice little uh, treasure troves. So it's like owl pellets, using those to <laughs> take yep. stock of the rodents in the area. <laughs> Tell us what the forest was doing. Poop over here. Well, speaking of animal digestion, specifically the very first step, which is the mouth. Ah, master of segues. <laughs> it's trained for years. <laughs> I have some news about a whale that seemed to be able to bite and filter feed. Huh. Giving us some information about how our filter feeding whales may have lost their teeth, or at least... One of the steps. Tell me more. 
This is research by Eric Eckdale and Thomas Demeray in Zoological Journal in, of the Linnaean Society. And the article is a press release by Sci News. So today, most whales we think of, when we say the word whale, we're thinking of filter-feeding baleen whales, right. you know, blue whales, humpback whales, those that take big mouthfuls of water and hopefully small animals and filter it out. Right, like Finding Nemo. And all of those whales lack teeth. So the baleen is a hair-like chitinous structure that filters, and they don't have any true teeth in their mouth while they're adults. They do have teeth in the womb, but they're born toothless. Okay. So it is that is another bit of evidence of the ancestry of when all whales were toothed. Right. Today, our toothed whales are largely dolphins and porpoises, mm -hmm. and then some things like sperm whales. Yes. But it's been a question for quite a while, how did they lose their teeth? Because we don't have any today that have hints of, you know, one, baleen and teeth, or show signs of having teeth with the baleen, or some baleen with the teeth. Right. You either have baleen, or you have teeth. So it's always been a question of how did we go from teeth, which we understand very well, to comb mouths right <laughs> that seems like a very extreme shift and it's been debated how you could make that shift and still be viable you know surviving well this whale a new species named Aetiocetus weltoni which is a cousin of today's baleen whales okay it is related to them seems to have had both teeth and baleen as an adult weird present in the mouth simultaneously this whale lived about 25 million years ago and is identified via a skull. And they researched it. They analyzed it, scanning it, and getting some high-resolution images. And they found grooves and holes on the roof of the mouth that connect to internal blood vessels. Okay. Which is very similar to the blood vessels we see that feed baleen and whales today. Gotcha. Because baleen, like our hair and fingernails, are ever-growing. Right. So they need to be nourished. So these, these seem to be kind of like baleen sockets as opposed to tooth sockets. Yeah, so these seem to have grooves and holes that are being fed by blood vessels, similar to today's baleen whales, which is interesting because it they have their tooth sockets and then they have these what may be baleen holes. Hmm. So they may have baleen and teeth, which is also interesting because it shows that the blood supply was co-opted from the teeth to the baleen for a new function. And so that these blood vessels would have just been, you know, for the roots of the teeth and have, were diverted to start growing hair in the mouth. Gotcha. And it gives us direct evidence that there may have very well been a stepwise evolutionary pattern of toothed whales, toothed baleen whales, baleen whales. Right. That there was a phase or a period where you may have had both whales, toothed and baleen, <laughs> that were surviving and using both. Which is not as strange as you might think, because today's baleen whales all have different hunting strategies. Like, they all hunt slightly different animals. Some of them hunt in very different ways. The gray whale sifts mud. It scoops up mm. mud off the ocean floor and then sifts it through its baleen. It's not taking big schools of fish. So... Baleen is actually still fairly versatile, you know, or at least more so than I knew of when I first learned about it, and yeah. most may think so. There may be more uses for teeth and baleen at the same time than you might initially think, so it might not be that silly of a, a setup. Yeah, I mean, you know, baleen seems real good for, like, plankton, and mm -hmm. teeth seem real good for when you're really hungry. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I would also, I can also imagine that if you are able to use baleen and teeth, like, if you can still chomp while having baleen, a mouthful of baleen, that in different seasons, maybe, or different, you know, parts of your migration cycle or whatever, it may be more beneficial to go after plankton at this time and fish at this time. Yeah, like when plankton is in bloom... And, you know, you have lots of krill or something going around feeding off of it. And there's big schools of small things. Filter feeding might be better right. versus when you wanted to, like, take another small whale. Yeah. But the fact that you pointed out that the baleen kind of splits the blood supply also makes me assume that it makes sense to stick to just one. Yeah. That, yeah, if your blood supply to your mouth now has to be split between teeth and baleen... Maybe it is beneficial to focus on one or the other. So you're not doing, you know, a half good job at each. Yeah. You can do a fully good job at just one. Could be a potential evolutionary pressure 
to lose your teeth. Yeah, exactly. That's a cool finding. Well, hey, speaking of the evolution of important structures, plants. I'll give it to you. Uh, Specifically, some news about the evolution of the modern structure of seeds in angiosperms. Mm. I chose some plant news for the alley episode. That's fitting. She'll be very proud of this. (laughs) This is research by Gong Le Shi et al. in Nature. And we will link to an article in Science Magazine by Elizabeth Panisi. Angiosperms are flowering plants. Yes. And we talked about the evolution of angiosperms back in 57 with Allie. And we discussed how the origins of angiosperms are just uh, what Dar- Darwin called the abominable mystery. <laughs> right? we, there's a lot we don't know. And one of the big questions in the origins of angiosperms is how they evolved their specific seed-related structures. So angiosperms treat their seeds differently from other plants. Angiosperms evolved from gymnosperm ancestors, which which are naked seed plants, right? They, they, you know, that's your pines and stuff like that. But angiosperms have a set of specific structures. At the center of a flower, there is a structure called the carpal which has the ovary at the bottom and then a tube that sticks up for catching pollen. Inside the ovary, uh, seeds develop, and the carpal often uh, develops into a pod. So if you think of beans or peas, those are the examples given in the article, the carpal develops that pod. Inside, you have seeds, and the seeds of angiosperms are protected by two layers, an inner coat and an outer coat. The outer coat, again, to pull an example from the article, Think of the hard outer shell of a bean or a pea. Yeah, like like the outer coating of an acorn, the right. tough part. These are important for angiosperms, but we don't know much about the early evolution of these structures. These are key flower structures. There are several gymnosperm fossils known with these sort of cup-shaped structures around their seeds that have been called cupules, which have been suggested as maybe related to those outer seed coats that we see in modern angiosperms, but those fossils, we don't have a lot of information about them, and no modern plants have those cupule structures. So there's nothing today to look at and go, oh, it's like this. Yeah. Weird. This new research describes some new plant fossils from a recently discovered uh, fossil site in a mine in Inner Mongolia. Uh, Inner Mongolia, incidentally, for anyone out there, is not like central Mongolia. Inner Mongolia is a province in China. Oh. The, these deposits, yeah, it's it's very strange. <laughs> these deposits uh, are an ancient swamp dating back to the early Cretaceous around 125 million years ago, which is also around the time of some of the earliest definitive angiosperm fossils. The researchers sliced and polished the rocks from this fossil site and were able to get microscopic looks, also yeah, CT scans, at the seeds and uh, associated structures preserved within. Oh. What they found were well-preserved cupules along with these seeds, these cup-shaped structures, and they could see that the cupules curve around the seeds, similar to the outer coats that we see on seeds and angiosperms today. When they compared these plants with a lot of the other fossil plants that have these cupule structures, they concluded that many of these plants are related to each other. That there seems to be a group of ancient plants that have these cupule structures. And they include a variety of different cupule uh, morphologies, but that this may be the group of plants in which this structure originates. And they also point out that some of those plants, the cupules, have leaves nearby that are modified in a way that makes them look a bit like carpels. Oh. That whole pod structure that surrounds the, the seeds in the ovary and everything else. So we might be looking at a group of plants that are showing the precursors to both the carpel and the outer coat of seeds of angiosperms weird that's like i I, it it makes no sense for me to have thought this but whenever i thought about like the earliest flowers i was like yeah sure they're going to be different you know but they're flowers right uh but that's a would be such a strange alien looking flower 
Yeah, with with a like s- sort of coat. Yeah, and a sort of pod with a seed goblet. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's also super bizarre to me because I would have assumed if you talked about like there's the two layers of a seed and we're not sure how the outer layer developed. My immediate assumption of like just how things tend to happen with stuff like this is that it would be like there was a layer around the seed and at some point it doubled, you know, there it got an extra layer right. that then eventually thickened up. Which in the abstract, they, there is mention of the fact that the outer coat is thought to be be developmentally linked to the inner coat which makes sense that the two coats are are developing in, uh, from similar origins but i wouldn't have thought of it being an incomplete outer coat a only partially covering yeah you would have expected the origins to be like a really thin outer coat or that something. then thickened up over time and became yeah. a protective layer whereas this sounds almost maybe like extra petals yeah sort of surrounding the seed that that or that, cones like on a, on a pine cone yeah that, that that you grew around the seed and became its outer coating over time that's so weird plants yeah. are bizarre <laughs> and the fact they point out that the fact that some of these plants have carpal-like structures, puts them in contrast with some other plants that have been thought to be closest relatives of angiosperms, because those other plants don't seem to have carpal-like structures. So potentially, not only are we, we might be looking at the group of plants in which carpels and outer coats around seeds developed, but these might be closer to angiosperms than the other plants we thought were closest to angiosperms. Absolutely. Wow. Overall, some very cool discoveries. Those are some big deal plant findings. Yeah, well, hey, speaking of changes in plants and changes in forests and changes in, I don't know, sharks and stuff, (laughs) we got a whole episode to do, now that the news is done, talking about biomes. Well, we'll be listening about biomes. Listening about (laughs) biomes. Yeah, we're going to, just like you, everybody out there, we're going to learn a bunch So we're going to take a short break, and when it is over, we will be back with our guest, Dr. Ali Baumgartner, to learn about today's topic. Woo! Hello, Ali. Hello! I'm so excited to be here! (laughs) <laughs> well, welcome back. Welcome back. We're happy to have you again. This episode, we have you here to talk to us about biomes. Are you excited to talk about biomes? I am working really hard to sit still. I am so excited <laughs> about biomes, y'all. Like, I'm so excited. This is one of those topics that is foundational in the sense that it comes up in a lot of episodes but we've never actually taken the time to slow down and really discuss this concept. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I noticed that you were using these (laughs) terms and weren't defining them. Right. We're using these words, but we don't actually know what they mean. Yeah. We'll say things like forest and desert and not even spare a thought to the fact that those, there are technical reasons for those words. I mean, I I know what those terms mean. They, uh, I, I'm familiar in them whenever they use them in video games. Right. Desert, deserts are hot and have sand. That's where I find cacti. (laughs) Some of those things are right. (laughs) Well, uh, I'm sure you're going to correct us, and as usual on Alley episodes, teach us a whole bunch of stuff we didn't know. Yes. But let's start with the basics. Could you please uh, answer this very simple question? What is a biome? And what go. <laughs> <laughs> what makes something, a region, a place, an area, a biome? Okay. So when I... It's... Like you said, it's one of these things, like, I totally know what that means. And then I looked into it, and it genuinely was, like, kind of deceptively simple, like, the explanation. And it's one of those things that, like, if you think about it for a little bit longer, like, oh, just kidding. This is actually very complicated. (laughs) But, broadly speaking, a biome uh, is a distinct biological community that has formed in response to a shared physical climate. Okay, so basically a biome is comprised of a variety of different habitats. So like, that's, that's it. Um, basically, to summarize, animals live in biomes. Plants are biomes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that puts it into beautiful perspective and is quite the flex on plants' parts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I it, it, it It's kind of intuitive. It's right there in the name. But I'd never really considered that a biome is largely defined by the life that is there. Yeah. Yeah. And- like, that's obvious now that I think about it. But I had never really thought that, oh, yeah, no, like, the kind of life you... It's not just that the biome determines the kind of life you have. The life you have determines the biome. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And we'll get to this a little bit more in a second. But, like, the biomes are literally named for the plants that live there. <laughs> so, like, yeah. But, yeah, it's one of those things where, like, I understand the concept. And I think it's because, like, deserts are an easy biome to visualize and are probably, like, the most cryptic biome in terms of, like, you see a forest and you see many trees. Um, <laughs> you look at a desert and you think you're just looking at dirt with, like, the odd cactus yep, or whatever. Right. Um, but, yeah, no, biomes are, like, biological communities. They're regional. And then they... you can break them down further and further. But by and large, uh, it's the way that communities are responding to climate. Gotcha. And of course, we talked about climate and how climate impacts life back in episode 113. And at this point, anyone who was confused as to why this is an alley episode <laughs> uh, is uh, hopefully has had those confusions uh, cured. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be talking a lot about plants. Uh, yeah, yeah. Pla- biomes are just plants, y'all. Like, I'm just like, yeah, there are animals there too, and they are like vital parts of biomes, but they're literally named for the plants. Like, come on. <laughs> well, and it makes sense because, like, plants are the, like, it, the reason we always learn about the uh, 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 primary producers when we were first learning biology concepts, it, it's plants in most situations because they are. The ones taking the energy from space and turning it into usable stuff. So yeah, they're the ones that decide (laughs) what goes on. Well, yeah, and not only that, but so one of the things I remember learning in my, I think it was intro geology class, that just like boggled my mind is when you're talking about naming a geological formation, you can't name it after a town because those can move. You have to name it after something that's a little bit more permanent. Turns out you can name geological formations after cemeteries because cemeteries don't move. Uh, but it's kind of the same same huh. thing with... Bi- I know, right? Sorry. Fun fact. Um, but it's kind <laughs> of the same thing with plants. Like, you can name a biome after plants because, like, animals can wander away if they change their mind, but plants are kind of stuck there. <laughs> that makes so much... That's such a simple, like, explanation, but it makes so much sense. So... We've got our definition. Now let's talk about what biomes actually look like. So when we do episodes about certain groups of life, certain types of animals or plants, we like to start off by talking about what does the modern diversity look like? And since biomes are plants, what does the diversity of biomes look like today? What, What sorts of things do we see when we're looking at biomes? So to start off, I'm going to preface by saying that there are, um, aquatic and marine biomes but i don't know a thing about them and i would not be confident talking about them so technically those exist too keep that in mind but i will be focusing on wonderful uh the terrestrial biomes so i looked this up and i went to multiple locations basically like okay how many biomes are there (laughs) and the consensus by and large was like roughly 14 um and okay yeah and that's because there's a little bit more like you can break things up probably a little bit more than you expected but by and large i came up with a very simple equation um (laughs) to figure out uh what kind of biome you're in so first of all you have your temperature so generally is it generally hot is it generally cool do you have lots of seasonality okay there's that Plus precipitation. Is it generally dry? Is it generally wet? Is it super seasonal? Um, Plus altitude, because that's going to kind of yank things one way or another. Uh, And then also local topography. So like, is it a very flat place? Do you also have um, low lying areas for swamps, things like that? So that's basically all you need. Temperature plus precipitation plus altitude plus local topography equals biome. It's really that simple. (laughs) Yeah, there you go, everyone. Now you too can define biomes at home. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm 
not going to go through all of them, but just broadly speaking, basically you can combine, if you have like cold temperature and relatively low precipitation, you're going to get something like a tundra. Uh, but if you have a little bit higher precipitation, slightly warmer temperatures, you're going to get into a taiga and boreal forest. And then all the way into, um, you know, tropical rainforest, very hot, very wet, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, you can have a lot of variability because if you have a given temperature, then you add um, elevation, you're going to suddenly get a new environment, uh, a new sort of biome. So yeah, it's it's when I was going through the, the list, my first gut was like, those seem very similar. Um, but you know what? 14 is a reasonable number. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah 14 is a lot lower than i would have guessed same that was my first thought as well like i was expecting it to be one of those like you know it's a spectrum not a list there's technically an infinite number sort of thing right uh so sorry yes but what we call the little like places in that are ecotones Ooh, good okay. word yes yeah, so an ecotone is the gradient between biomes so you're right. It is totally a spectrum. Um, and that's kind of what you you call the the in-between spaces. Awesome. Gotcha. And I like that earlier you pointed out that a biome is a collection of habitats. Mm -hmm. So that a single biome can have different areas within it. You know, we were talking before we started recording about how we've discussed some sort of biome habitat related things in recent episodes that episode 114 was about polar life which focused very heavily on a particular kind of biome one or two and episode 112 was about caves which are a habitat that could exist in many different biomes uh typically underneath those biomes yes yes <laughs> <laughs> yes yes but yeah if you think about like gray for an ex for example um you can have a forest biome that may have like a freshwater pond within it um like right. you can have these multiple things and that's what i was talking about with like the local topography you know you could have these low-lying uh, ephemeral pond areas and things like that um in order to get have a little bit more like biomes are not just copy paste copy paste copy paste trees like that's not how it that's not how it <laughs> works you're gonna have a little bit of variability and these things are large um they're they're they could be pretty big reason, regions. And I actually, okay, so you were you were both like, that's such a small number. I was expecting more. That is a lot more than I was expecting. Um, <laughs> but that's because I work with a, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. I work with a simplified version when I'm doing my paleo environmental reconstructions. I don't use 14 gotcha. biomes. I use fewer than that. I can't remember. For the life of me, I can't remember off the top of my head how many I use, but it is less than 14. <laughs> yeah, a more broad sense yeah. uh, grouping. Yes, yes. So let me ask you this. What biome do you currently live in? I... So you are in Kansas now. Yes. I am in western Kansas. So I am in a... Um, so broadly speaking, I am in a, in a prairie. Um, but specifically I am in the short grass prairie. Okay. And I, Ooh. I would assume that a prairie, the plants that typify a prairie are going to be largely grassy plants as opposed to lots of trees yes. and uh, presumably by the name shorter grasses. Yes. So I, it is devoid of velociraptors. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, prairie is a type of grassland. Um, you can use the terms interchangeably. Um, but they also, so while it is primarily dominated by grasses you can have um gallery forests which i think is a super cool term that literally just means trees along a river that's all oh yeah. riparian yeah so but a gallery a term that yeah, yes okay. that would also be a term i've heard, I've heard that word before <laughs> i have used that word before uh but yeah so a gallery forest is basically just like the trees that will go along a river but you'll also find those in the prairie um and yes, short grass gotcha. prairie, because you will have variation uh, based on the amount of precipitation. I did a video, I have recorded this video, it has not yet aired, so spoilers, um, about <laughs> grasslands uh, for the Sternberg Museum. And yes, as you go across Kansas, um, as uh, you get closer to the mountains and precipita precipitation decreases, the grass gets shorter. 
So you have tall grass prairie okay. on the east side, and as you go west, you get to western Kansas, and we got short grass prairie. It's like two feet tall, which is short for grass. Yeah. So I'm going to give you another one. Okay. Uh, you spent lots and lots of time where we are now in East Tennessee. Mm -hmm. What is our biome? Okay. So that is a temperate broadleaf forest. Um, I would refer to it more specifically as the Eastern deciduous forest. Um, but broadly, it is a type of temperate broadleaf forest. So the majority of the trees there are going to as the name suggests, <laughs> have broad leaves. So these are going to be angiosperms, <laughs> flowering plants, which was... Episode... Oh, episode 57. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So, yes, it's primarily uh, broad leaf angiosperms, and it's temperate. So you have warm summers, cool winters, seasonal precipitation. It's the best biome. Maybe. <laughs> I, I, yeah. It's the one I've grown up in. It's the one I spent most of my Same. life in. <laughs> it's the one that I know the plants the best in. I have... When when friends send me pictures of plants from the Eastern Deciduous Forest, I can identify them. If you send me a plant from almost anywhere else, I will try real hard. But, like, I don't... I <laughs> may not know them. I, I liked when we were talking about the biomes having various habitats within them. And what it made me think of is like living in different parts of a city where it's like, you can live downtown in an apartment or a townhouse or a house, but you could also live on the outskirts or in the suburbs and live in an apartment townhouse. You know, you can live in various types of residence, but what you're as uh, around you can change. And I, I like that reminder that a broadly forest is just not trees all the way through you could have a pond, you could have a, a stream, you could have a cave, you could have various things within it that, and especially if you want to zoom in, you could have the outside of the tree, the inside of the tree. And so it is it is built out of these habitat building blocks, there which I really layers. like. That's a cool way to think about biomes. It's like a parfait. Do you have... <laughs> Everybody loves parfaits. Do you have in front of you the list of the names of the 14? I do. Could you, without going into d detail or description, yeah. list the names of the 14 bodies? All right, I'm on Because I'm really curious. Yes. I'm sure our listeners yes. are too. <laughs> okay. Some of them have multiple names. Uh, or like, it's this or this. But all right. Yeah. No context. Here we go. Tundra. Taiga slash boreal forest. Temperate carnivorous forest. Broadleaf forest. Mixed forest. Uh, montane grasslands and shrublands. Mediterranean forests woodlands, uh, scrub or sclerophyll forests, mangrove, uh, moist broadleaf forest, dry broadleaf forest, coniferous forest, flooded grasslands and savannas, grasslands, savannas, and shrublands, deserts, and xeric shrublands. There we go. Ah. Nice. Cool. Mangrove gets its own entry. Yes. Yeah. How about that? Yes. Oh, I love mangroves. Also Mediterranean far. But no, let's move on. <laughs> the last question I want to ask before we get into uh, some more detail on things is why is why are biomes important? Why is the classification of different biomes significant? Why should we care what biome a particular area fits into? All right. So simple answer. Humans like putting things in boxes. <laughs> you sure do. And, th and that's we're amazing. good at it. Right? Like, all, all <laughs> of science is like, we're going to make smaller and smaller boxes to put things in. Um, but it, it is a useful way of understanding uh, patterns of ecosystems globally. So basically, we can extrapolate based on these patterns. So these patterns can be used in paleoclimate and paleoenvironmental reconstructions. So basically... It's just a way of kind of puzzling together uh, broad scale patterns of the world as we know it. And we can use that to understand the past and the future. So that's that's basically it. It's just a good way of like organizing things. You can color code the map really easily with biomes. Well, and I've seen those biome maps, oh, yeah. which are super delightful. Yes. Well, and I feel like it's always uh, uh, useful to point out that a big reason why we put things into boxes is just for communication purposes. Just so that when I'm discussing, you know, what fossil ecosystem I'm studying and I say it was a taiga that was this million years old, everyone else can very quickly either already know what I mean or look it up 
and confirm what I mean that it we're, it's it's a big part of it isn't because it needs to be put into a box but if we're going to discuss it it sure does help if we have terms to use to discuss these things yeah exactly like right. it's one of those things biomes are like you said they're basically a spectrum they're not it's a gradient it's not concrete boxes you move from one biome to the next it is a gradient but it does make it a whole lot easier to look at things on kind of a a a bigger scale and yeah look at these patterns and it does make it a whole lot easier to communicate because like if i tell you that you're in a forest dominated with quercus and acer and you know juglins you're gonna be like what (laughs) but if i say (laughs) that you are in a temperate deciduous forest you're gonna be like i you're right i am this is true (laughs) yep yep so uh, you have you have now alluded a number of times to the fact that biomes are something that we study not only in the present day, but also in the past. Obviously, there have always been biomes. So let's start talking a little bit more about the how we come to understand these things. Before we get to the fossil side of things, I want to ask, how do we identify a biome? In, in modern times, we'll start with, with today. If I plop you down on a random spot on a continent somewhere, how do you, what do you, when you look around and go, okay, what biome am I, am I in? Okay. What are you using to identify your biome? All right. So I will, I've actually sort of kind of been in that situation. <laughs> not, not exactly, but sort of kind of. So I took a field ecology class in undergrad and uh, yeah, just got like plopped down in a forest in uh northern lower michigan and they were like describe it um so broadly speaking there are two main things that you're going to look for because animals i was gonna say animals are useless and that's not at all what i mean um (laughs) (laughs) and i don't mean it that way but (laughs) But they're not useful for biomes like i said animals live in biomes plants are the biome so basically, there are two. Main <laughs> it's a, you don't you don't define an a, uh, an apartment complex by the people living in it. It's right. the type of building it is. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, there are two main things that you use to identify uh, different, like classify different types of biomes, and that's going to be the plants, but also the soil. Um, and I huh. would like to. This is going to upset some soil people, but I stand by this. <laughs> I think Uh-oh. okay. I think that paleo... We're going to have to do a soils episode to right. make up for it. We're going to have to put a disclaimer at the beginning of this episode. <laughs> you really you really should. The no, views no, no. expressed by, by Allie <laughs> do not reflect the views of the podcast. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> I think that botanists and pedologists or like paleobotanists and paleopedologists, I think that we need to be friends. Like, I think that we should rise up against the animal overlords and just like take over because <laughs> well that's all the time we have for this episode <laughs> uh, but specifically uh so but no okay so there is a lot of discussion about whether or not you can have a soil without plants people feel multiple ways about it but regardless by and large a lot of the structures a lot of the things that we used to identify soils and used to classify fo- soils are related to the plants and the environments that they're living in. Um, so you look at the plants, you look at the soil. Uh, when I was dropped off in that forest in Northern lower Michigan, uh, there was this huge soil pit, uh, which, which was actually really useful because by looking at the different types of soil that you have, you can actually get a pretty good sense of the environment because it's going to tell you not just the plants the plants that live there, but also how nutrients move through the environment. And that also can tell you a lot about a biome. So again, to reiterate, biomes are temperature plus precipitation plus altitude plus local topography. That makes a biome. So the ways that we categorize biomes have kind of varied over the years. In order to simplify it and make this model in any way useful, because if you make it too big, it's just the world. They typically focus on temperature and precipitation and sometimes elevation. So this is where I was talking about, I don't use that many biomes. So as a paleobotanist, uh, when I'm doing environmental reconstructions, I use a Whitaker diagram. So it's named after the guy who developed it. And it just looks at 
temperature, no, temperature and precipitation. You can't see it, but I'm doing an X and Y axis. So it's a triangle. So you have temperature along one axis, you have precipitation along the other, and then you basically have these this gradient that as temperature increases, you get these different types of environments and as precipitation inv- uh, increases, you have different types of environments. So that's, that's a simple way of doing it. I went down such a rabbit hole about <laughs> biomes because y'all, uh, this is what I, this is what I live for. Like, this is the thing. This is why I'm a paleobotanist. Like, this is specifically what I find most interesting. I guess super into it. But it is really important to also consider where you are in the world um, when you're talking about biomes. Because just because you have a tropical rainforest, like a tropical rainforest is going to look fundamentally different in on different continents. Um, so there, broadly speaking, there are eight terrestrial biogeographic realms, okay? So there is the Nearctic, so that is the uh, North American Arctic, the Pale Arctic, which is the Eurasian Arctic, um, the Neotropics, so that's South America, the Afrotropics, which is Africa, uh, Australasia, Indomalaya, Oceania, and the Antarctic, which is... Antarctica. Um, within those, you'll find the 14 um, biomes we discussed earlier. So basically, it's just a way of breaking it down. So you may be in the Afrotropic biogeographic realm, and an ecoregion within that might be a particular type of forest. So the one that I was looking up was the Northern Acacia, Comifera, Bushlands, and Thickets. Okay, so basically, big, bringing it down. But just because you can have tropical rainforests in South America, Africa, and Asia, like they're not the same. Like the, the, the temperatures may be the same, but the precipitation may be very similar. But the plant communities and the animal communities can be very different. I'm going to tell you briefly about one of the coolest studies I have ever read about. I only read about it because I was being sassy and trying to prove a point. So... <laughs> Uh, it's a paper by Emmons and Gentry from 1983, and I think it's absolutely br- brilliant. Emmons is a mammologist, and Gentry was a botanist. And so they teamed up on this paper titled Tropical Forest Structure and the Distribution of Gliding and Prehensile Tailed Vertebrates. Cool. I love every word in that title. <laughs> it's the coolest, it's seriously, it's like the coolest paper I've ever read. So basically they found that you could not ignore biogeography. You couldn't ignore where you were in the world when you were looking at these plant and animal communities. For example, they were looking specifically at basically why do you see different types of locomotion in these different types of forests? The mammal groups that are there play a large role. So for example, there are no marsupials in Africa. Right. And yep. there are no flying squirrels in South America. Right. And part of that is also due... So you have the groups that are there, but also the structure of the forest. So Asian forests, where you have lots of gliders, you know, sugar gliders and all the, the gliding snakes, and everybody decided to start gliding. <laughs> um, <laughs> Asian forests don't have very many lianas or vines. So there's no obstacles. The plant, the trees are far apart. There's nothing in your way. Just might as well glide. Oh. Right? So versus African forests, uh, African forests are super dense and tend to have a whole lot of lianas and vines. So like you can just walk from tree to tree. You don't need anything special. Like I can just walk. See, I just I just watched I just rewatched Disney Tarzan mm-hmm. recently, mm-hmm. Yeah. and now like everything about it's like all right, no, yeah, absolutely makes sense why he could surf everywhere. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like the the branches are are hefty, the trees are close together. Like yeah, that was easy. And there are some lianas, but like <laughs> there, there are plenty of lianas. So if he wanted to, if Tarzan wanted to go sl- swinging, also. That doesn't work. We're going to take a, like, 10-second tangent. (laughs) The reason you cannot swing on a vine is because vines and lianas are rooted in the ground. Yeah, they don't grow down. They grow up. (laughs) So, like, if you grab a vine, it's just going to fall down. Like, it's just not going to work, y'all. Um... But yeah, and finally, you need something realistic like web shooters. Yes, exactly. Something reasonable. That would work. That would work. 
Uh, but yeah, in South American forests have fewer lianas and they have the trees have thinner branches. And so that's why you have things like the brachiation and uh, prehensile aisle tails, because it helps you move between trees. There are still obstacles, but like, you know, you just need an extra arm. Right, right. And when you say brachiation, you're referring to the way that monkeys move through trees with their arms. Yes, this, this, yeah. uh, uh, which is also, uh, I've, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the part of the world where we see tree sloths. Mm-hmm. Uh, doing yes. something very very similar exactly exactly um <laughs> you got to enjoy my impression of brachiation uh fortunately yeah. no yes. one else we, did we're but... on video someday someday we will we'll, we'll get <laughs> I, Allie on video i took a i took a biological anthropology class with laura mcclatchy when i was at the university of michigan and i have never seen anyone do impressions of primate locomotion as well as her Oh my goodness. <laughs> like her impression of brachiation, her impression of uh, knuckle walking, flawless, but I digress. <laughs> so clearly there's a bunch of different factors you can use to differentiate biomes in the modern world. And there are things that the ways that biomes are influencing the kind of life, the kind of plants, the kind of animals you can expect to see. But of course, uh, this is a paleontology podcast above all other things. And typically, uh, that means things are harder. So as a paleobotanist, please shed some light. Uh, There are biomes now. There have been biomes in the past. How do we identify a biome from the fossil record? How do we know when we are excavating fossils here in Gray, there in Kansas, wherever we are, what biome we are tapping into? Oh, this is... This is my jam. Like, this is what I'm here for. (laughs) Uh, So first of all, it depends on the fossils that you have, whether or not you can make, how far out you can go in terms of environment. Um, So if you have plants or if you have paleosols or if you have both, then that's really what you're looking for. Um, Because like I keep saying, and I'm just going to keep repeating this, animals live in a biome. Plants are the biome. So you can use animals. But really, if you can have plants, if you can have paleosols, that's fantastic. And it could be a variety of different things. Well, and, and I, I, uh, I, your point earlier about animals can move and plants can't, I think is also important to remember that like there are animals that cover multiple biomes that like, you know, a, a raccoon can be found in the forest, but it can also be found yeah, you know, on the edges of the forest, coming into other environments and in cities and stuff, and, right. and there birds some, can be found yeah. anywhere that there's something tall for them to perch on. I was like, going to say there are some animal, like birds, is a great example. I was going to say things like elephants yep. and bison, where an individual over the course of a year can just move from biome to biome. So, like, yeah, you, you, having an animal can be helpful to maybe narrow it down. Like, if you find a crocodile, you now know that you're probably dealing with a wet environment, probably a warm environment. But is it, you know, what kind of biome is it in still might not be immediately clear. Right, exactly. And I like to, I'm a proponent of the scientific buddy system. Uh, I think (laughs) that you should use as many different things as you possibly can. Like the more different um, avenues that you can incorporate, the better off that you're going to be. So like plants, that's great. But if you can also get paleosols, oh, that's even better. And then if you could also get a sense of like, oh, but there's, you know, crocodilians, like, oh, cool, that tells me something. And you can build and build and build from there. Um, Yeah, like the more, more things are better. And like, I have been giving animals a hard time because I think they deserve it. (laughs) (laughs) We we get it. (laughs) That's the price animals pay for being better. Yes, yes. Oh, it gives me flashbacks to our masters. But basically everybody told me that their thesis could eat my thesis. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we used to have those debates of whose thesis could eat whose. And I was very happy that for the, the time I was there, I was the winner most oh, times. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was literally and figuratively the bottom of the food chain. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so could you give us uh, a couple of examples of perhaps of fossil sites you work on now or have worked on and how you have identified biomes in them? Oh, I would absolutely love to. So I just had a paper published uh, a few weeks ago that this is Congrats. literally what I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> so 
I looked at three fossil sites in uh, Western Kenya from the early Miocene, so roughly 18 million years ago. And I used plants um, to get a sense of the paleoclimate and the paleoenvironment. And I use those terms not quite interchangeably, but roughly interchangeably, because we will use the plants to get a sense of the paleoclimate, so the temperature and precipitation. And then by extension, we can also use that to reconstruct the paleo environment. So we did this in a variety of ways. We started off with the plants, but whenever we could, we would incorporate other things. So for example, one of the sites um, that I was looking at had a crocodilian bone bed, <laughs> which was super cool. Multiple individuals in the same place. So like, okay, this there was something happening in here. And then you can tie that with uh, sedimentology. So not just paleocells, but also like there were ripple marks showing that there was flow- flowing water, but there were also layers of evaporites, meaning that like the water was there and then it all dried up. <laughs> Fun fact, uh, the evaporite layer was the favorite layer of the goats on the island and they would go makes and sense. lick the evaporites, which makes sense. But one of the sites, R3, I think is really kind of the gold standard of using as many different things to really get a a full picture of the paleo environment. Um, And that was because not only, so I had the fossil leaves that I looked at, a colleague of mine had the paleosols. There were also in situ stumps. So stumps that were preserved in life position, upright, coming out of the ground, like a stump, with extensive um, root networks. So you could use the so use the leaves to get a sense of the paleo temperature, paleo precipitation, broadly the biome. But in addition, you could look at what the paleosols are telling you about possibly seasonality. Um, and they used forestry techniques to estimate the canopy cover based on the size of the stumps and their proximity to each other. So if the tree is this big around and its neighbor is this big and they're this close to each other, like what was the canopy like? Cool. Right? Absolutely amazing. And then in addition, they also had vertebrates. So you're looking at all of these, all of these different things. So the, it was, it was one of those things that I, I might've talked, I might've talked to you guys about it. Maybe I haven't talked to it talk to you about it on the podcast. But one of the things that you have to be very careful, though, when you're using all of these different scales, all these different proxies is um, making sure you're you do know what scale you're talking about. Because, you know, a single tree is a different time. uh, The lifespan of a single tree is different than like an entire soil profile developing. Versus like the, the, the lifespan of an animal, etc. And yeah, by putting all these things together, looking at, okay, well, The animals are the types of things that you would expect based on a forested biome. And hey, we've got literal tree trunks (laughs) and (laughs) huge leaves. And then one of the other cool things that that we were able to do, because... Like, like we said, a biome is made up of multiple habitats. And so we were able to sample multiple sub-localities at the site and show that there was lateral heterogeneity, meaning that if you moved across the landscape, if you're standing over here, the only fossils that I was finding were from the trees. But if I moved a little bit further away from the stumps, I was finding leaves of emergent aquatics. So things that were rooted below the water and then would come above. So not specifically water lilies, but like a water lily is rooted beneath and comes above. And that means that on parts of the landscape, you had at least periodic ponding of water. And that is the same thing that we saw when we looked at the paleosols. Like they were, that that was supported by the paleosols. So yeah, like the more different ways that you can attack the prog- the problem, you can be a better time traveler and get a, a better sense of <laughs> of it. Because, yeah, like, you can do things with animals. I believe Rachel talked about it. You can look at the gear ratio of animals. Like, okay, is, does it have a sturdy ankle? Does it, so that it won't trip through the forest? Or does it have a, like, I'm going to run real fast ankle so that it can run mm-hmm. away from things on the savanna? And so, like, that can tell you things, but the plants are better. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> So at that site, what biome was it? Okay, so it was cool. 
at the bottom of the section, there was a tropical rainforest, and then we moved up and it got drier. The crocodile site was a woodland. And then as we continued and got to the super fancy site with all the stuff, it went back to a tropical seasonal forest. So not quite as wet as it had been before, but it's kind of cool because you can see how um, changes in precipitation completely changed the biome that we saw. Like we had almost com- like almost complete turnover of plants in half a million years. And then almost like, not almost complete, but like a, a lot of things came back 500,000 years later, which is super cool. Very cool. The coolest part about it though, there were no vertebrates found at the, the lowest site because it was just, there were just plants there. It happens. Um, but the other two localities, with the exception of the primates, the vertebrates were completely different. But the same primates were found at both sites, which is evidence mm. that that the primates were doing great in multiple different environments. And you cannot use primates as an indication of a forested environment. This is my soapbox. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That they they transitioned even though everything else around them was changing. They just stuck around. Yeah, I can make this work. Very cool. Yeah, that that is kind of like the, what primates do. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm glad that you used that example because it drives home one of the points that through paleontology, we are studying how life has changed over time. We can also study how biomes have changed over time, not just in a specific place that, yes, one area that is, you know, a forest today was something different in the past, and you can see that change through the fossil record, but also globally that where biomes are and what kind of biomes we have has changed over time. And that transitions very nicely into the next section of the episode, the latter half of this discussion, where we're going to talk about how biomes have changed over time and what it has meant for life on Earth. We're going to do that after this break. The biomes that we have today have not always been available. Correct. Through time, the diversity of biomes has changed. Now, at the end of the last section... Ali, you described how biomes can shift over time with changes in climate, with changes in precipitation and such. But now I want to talk a little bit about how biomes come and go through time. Can you talk to us about how does a biome originate? How do you get through time a new biome? Okay, so in order to answer that question, refresher on my... uh equation to calculate biome so temperature this is like the drake equation but for biome (laughs) exactly highly scientific y'all okay temperature (laughs) plus precipitation plus altitude plus local topography equals biome and i made that equation at the beginning of my plan for this episode and then i got down here and realized i was a genius and it was gonna be really (laughs) helpful (laughs) Isn't that always nice to discover? <laughs> Golly, I make good choices sometimes. Um, so, oh man, whoever thought this up is brilliant. Oh wait, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Past me did a great job on this. So okay, basically <laughs> those are the overall criteria. So as these different uh, variables in this equation change, you can see changes to the diversity and the abundance of biomes, and you can see new ones arise and old ones can disappear. So as those different things change, we see changes globally of biomes. So on a global, like, massive scale, biomes are driven by abiotic forces, such as tectonics. So it's these really, because we're talking about these huge regional patterns that are held together by climate mostly, uh, they are super sensitive to these big abiotic changes. So mountain building can lead to changes in elevation and precipitation regimes. Tectonic drift moves plates from the equator to the poles. So changes in atmospheric makeup can influence the viability of biomes. So it's it was a surprisingly big answer. <laughs> 
I wasn't, I wasn't really, I didn't really think about it. Cause like biomes, it's like how you guys were like, oh yeah, biomes. I didn't think that they were made of life. Well, I forgot that they weren't controlled by it. <laughs> well, I, and I guess to talking about the way biomes are driven by climate and other non-biological factors, we've talked uh, in, in a couple episodes recently about the fact, for example, that there haven't always been permanent ice caps on Earth. That if you go back to the Cretaceous, for example, global climate was warm enough that you did not have environments like that. And that, I would imagine, would limit the kinds of cold climate biomes that could even exist on the planet. Right, exactly. And like that, one of the things that paleobotanists and like paleoclimatologists kind of argue about is what kind of temperature gradient do you have if you don't have ice the poles? Because like how hot is the equator going to be in comparison to the poles if you don't have that kind of a balance coming from the ice caps? And yeah, like one of the things that I didn't really consider is just how much mountains matter. Yeah. Because not only do they change the elevation, obviously, of the things that are living there. If you are on a mountain, your elevation will change. But not just that, like the presence of mountains completely changes your precipitation regime. And again, that's going to mm-hmm. have a fundamental uh, impact on what kind of biome you have. Like, for example, I'll talk about this more specifically, but like you wouldn't have grasslands without mountains. Like without the Rockies, the Great Plains wouldn't exist. Yeah. And also, and, and mountains are famously r- responsible in a lot of cases for deserts. Yep. Because exactly. they create a rain shadow effect and exactly. they rob that area of precipitation. I would imagine that also through time, not only since you, you've been uh, very adamant that biomes are plants, that what plants are available is going to affect what kind of biomes you can have. For example, you can't have tree. You can't have forests without trees. Yeah, I was about to say you pre-forests. Know? I'm betting biomes looked very, very different. Right, yes. right. Yes, yes. And this brings me into a question that I thought of while we were planning this episode, and it was one of those questions that I was like, I honestly don't know what the answer to this is. <laughs> Let's make Allie answer it. What were the first biomes? Okay, so. This question, as I was reading through the questions that we were going to be talking about, I got to this one and thought, why have I never learned this? Like, do we (laughs) know this? Is this knowable? So I had a delightful deep dive uh, figuring this out. It was so much fun. I have been sitting on this for like two weeks. Uh, (laughs) I've, I've wanted to tell so many people. Okay, so. Again, we are just talking terrestrial biomes because I am in no way qualified to talk about any other kind of biome. I can only talk (laughs) about ones with plants. So strictly speaking, in the first terrestrial biome that I am in any way confident existed didn't occur until sometime in the Ordovician. However, we don't know what it was because our our understanding of Ordovician plants is based on spores. So, like, who knows <laughs> what they were actually like. But the earliest land plant macrofossils, so, like, body parts, are bryophytes, so mosses, from the Silurian. There is a paper uh, that came out in 2006 uh, by Tomescu and Rothwell that described an early Silurian wetland environment in a river floodplain. Ooh. And that makes perfect sense that it would be a wetland. Because if you think about it, the earliest plants, these bryophytes, were non-vascular. So they don't have many roots. They don't have internal tubes to move water and nutrients around. They don't have xylem xylem or phloem. So they had to live in wet environments. So think about, you know, mosses today. So they have to be in these wet environments in order to not just completely dry out. So that's basically what world was was just (laughs) these mossy wetlands but you got to keep in mind that they can't really go far from water so i have no idea what may or may have been going on in upland environments if they didn't have water like moss aren't gonna do great so was it just kind of like bare rock and then moss i'm not sure 
But we also know that the, the wetlands go into the early Devonian, so the Rhiney Chert in Scotland, and the Battery Point Formation uh, in Gaspé, Quebec, Canada, those are both these early Devonian wetlands. And it's funny because, like, we start off with, I have no idea what was going on in the Ordovician, into, like, oh, <laughs> we got, you know, little mossy wetlands in the Silurian and into the early Devonian, and then the Devonian, everything changes. Yeah. <laughs> everything was fine until the Devonian started. That's I, right. I mean, kind of. <laughs> so I, it, it makes, you're, you're right. It makes total sense that wetlands, like the earliest macro life on land was tied to water before it started invading the rest of the land. I imagine that in the ocean, I mean, there were corals back then mm-hmm. and a, there would have been reef habitats and things like that. And I guess if you go back far enough, the biomes would have been, if anything, defined by microbial life, which I I wonder if that means that they would not be recognizable, identifiable biomes by modern standards. Exactly. I saw speculation that prior to these wetlands that we have evidence for in the early Silurian, there might have been, so kind of like in deserts, you have like the desert crust that is, it's a very alive thing in like, it's, it might just look like a, you know, crust in the desert, but it is an, a living organism. And you, there may be, there may have been these like bacterial kind of like biofilms um, on, mm-hmm. on the land before that, but as far as I'm aware, I wasn't able to find much evidence for that. Um, and I'm not really sure what you would have to even look for in order to find that. Like, I don't know what that would look like. I would not recognize it. Right. A, a region with high temperatures and high precipitation and low altitude, but no plants mm-hmm. <laughs> doesn't really compute yeah. By our modern biome standards. Exactly. And like, how would you even recognize that in the fossil record? Like, I'm guessing you would need, like, when in doubt, it's probably isotopes. Like, isotopes yeah. can do anything. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of like when we find a, an animal with a morphology that is just not analogous to anything alive today. Where it's you like... You don't see a shape like that in the world. There's nothing shaped like a therizinosaur anymore. So, what were you doing? Uh, we can We can guess... But we we don't have anything to uh, draw direct info on. So if it's a biome that we don't have one of today, we're we're lacking a lot of the tools we would usually use to try to identify or define it. Exactly, yeah. and the non uh, non analogous biomes are something you run into a lot in the in the fossil record. And honestly, you run into them like. You don't have to go very far back in time to get to things you don't have today. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's talk a bit about... So, obviously, new biomes can show up. Obviously, there was a time where all or most of our modern terrestrial biomes did not exist. And we have we slowly sort of collected more diversity of biomes. And one can only imagine, since, as you've pointed out, a biome not only is based on life, but impacts life that can survive in an area that when a new biome arises, it means big change. I'm sure this has happened many, many times, but could you perhaps with one or two of your favorite examples, talk about what happens when a, when the earth is introduced to a new type of biome it hasn't seen before. Uh, it changes the world. <laughs> like that that's it that's that's the answer it's it's amazing so like i like i said in the silurian and into the early devonian we have these little mossy wetland things and then suddenly by the middle devonian we have vascular plants so then plants can get a little bit taller and they can get a little bit further from water not long after we get the first trees so watesia and then suddenly the world is our oyster, and like once you have trees, you have like the possibilities are basically endless. So, I saw a paper that again kind of blew my mind because there was a sentence in it that said, Before the evolution of the seed, mountains were probably bare. Whoa, oh, 
Huh. I don't know that I like that. I was going to say, I don't like that at all. <laughs> right? And it, it does it does make sense because um, that's kind of like the, I don't like, you know, assigning progress to evolution. But in terms of like getting away from the water, like the seed was like, all right, we are really getting there, y'all. Yeah, that was the plant's amniotic egg. Right. <laughs> Literally, it's so funny. Like this, the similarities between plants and animals, like tr- uh, terrestrialization, like, there are many similarities. <laughs> but yeah, once you once you are vascular and once you so you can move water around and once you have seeds, like you don't rely on water at all in order to reproduce and suddenly you can go everywhere. And so that's why from um the Devonian that's when you start, like, by the end of the Devonian, there are forests. And then, you know what comes after the Devonian? The Carboniferous. This <laughs> is literally, like, plants' heyday. This was their time to shine. Like, we are still dealing with the consequences of the rainforests of the Carboniferous. Like, th- this is still <laughs> something that's impacting the planet. Like, the, the, right. So, basically, it's all, I really think that in terms of, like, impressive new biomes the wetland the first wetlands i mean they're the first but like once we figure i say we like i'm a plant once plants yep, yep. <laughs> i do i do this every time uh once plants figured out forests and rainforests and just were able to like okay look at all this biomass we got like that's really when everything changed and we see other novel biomes arising uh so for example i've talked about grasslands that is another no- like novel ecosystem another novel biome that has only really been around for a handful of million years yeah we talked uh, a whole lot in episode 38 about what it meant for the world when grasslands happened when we got lawns you know <laughs> 30 million years or so ago <laughs> exactly. when everything changed because suddenly there were prairies and savannas and such yeah and even just the uh, the advent of the modern rainforest, because it has a very particular type of hydrology. Like, they literally make their own weather. Like, you know, plants... Plants are really good at, <laughs> at, at <laughs> like, changing the world. Well, I think that, uh, you know, you talked about the advent of trees. Uh, incidentally, for more about trees, go watch, listen to episode 73, which also featured Allie. Just the sheer number of biomes that were on the list that you recited at the beginning of the episode that were forests mm-hmm. right broadleaf forests and coniferous forests and rain forests the trees are what determines right your status as a forest and i think it's also really important to point out that the time period from the devonian into the carboniferous where we see the spread of trees and we see the spread of forests is also the time where we see the spread and arise of most of the major groups of animals on land that we see, right? That's when we see the diversification of amphibians on land. It's when we see the origination of reptiles uh, and the animals that would eventually give rise to mammals and reptiles as we know them today. New biomes not only means that there are a variety of different habitats you can live in, it means that there are now a variety of different habitats you can evolve and adapt to be specialized for, which provides for lots of diversification for plants and animals. Yeah, absolutely. Plants were just getting the world ready for animals. <laughs> well, and, uh, Laying out the carpet. The yeah, green exactly. carpet. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, it's also, I think, cool to remember that like forests aren't just a, a place to live, but like they affect the weather and like, like the, the craziest thing I ever, that I will have ever seen was the first time I saw a documentary that showed clouds forming out of the tropical rainforest in South America as it just pumped moisture into the air. And it's like, yeah, that's you. Mosses don't do that, you know? <laughs> so like now you can suddenly have a fundamentally different weather system surrounding these forests. And it's when a tree dies, that's a whole bunch of biomass that's now going back into the environment in a different way than it used to. Like it's, it's a big deal when 
plants decide to start growing in a fundamentally different way. Yeah. And I would also imagine that as new biomes come about, it can also have the opposite effect. You know, when when we see the spread of grasslands in the mid-Cenozoic or throughout the Cenozoic, we also see the disappearance of a lot of ecosystems that were specialized for forests and, and other types of environments. And it can be that, yeah, when grasses are spreading and now it's the heyday of horses and rodents and things that are specialized for that habitat we, yeah now you're in you're in you're out of luck if you were not adapted for surviving in that kind of place yes <laughs> now let's talk about the flip side of that equation of that scenario that yes you can get new biomes originating over time which i think is something that is fascinating to think about but it stands to reason that the opposite can also happen, that you can lose biomes. Ali, how do biomes go extinct? Can a biome go extinct? So, yes, biomes can go extinct. They have gone extinct. And it's, it's, I kind of think of it as, when they, they, they come in, oh no, they come in with a bang and kind of leave with a whimper. Mm -hmm. That's typically how extinction goes. Yeah. Yeah. Origination! Extinction. Yeah. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Yeah, exactly. So basically, okay, I'm recentering this uh, equation. Temperature, precipitation, altitude, local topography equals biome. And I mentioned this before. Abiotic changes can lead to these biomes going away. If the tectonic plates are going to move things, the appearance of ice caps are going to change things so yeah they plants okay plants are great they do everything on hard mode because plants have two options when it comes to biomes and climatic changes um they can either adapt or they can go extinct uh <laughs> which i mean is technically true of everybody but like a, a single individual animal can move in its lifetime. Plants gotta right. wait. Like, I send my seeds over there. Hopefully somebody survives. Exactly. My kids can maybe move somewhere. Yes. <laughs> I can't. Go on without me, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, basically, uh, biomes will... More often, biomes will kind of shuffle themselves rather than going completely extinct. So, like, today... We are seeing, as temperatures warm, the coldest places are shrinking because it's getting warmer and warmer. Um, but you have basically just the shifting of, as temperatures get warmer, then okay, well then what class, what falls within this temperature regime is just going to move further and further north to kind of follow that belt of temperature. But they definitely can go extinct, and they have in the past. What are some examples of biomes that have gone extinct that we do not have anymore? Uh, well, the Carboniferous Rainforest. <laughs> yeah, that would be one. <laughs> hey, I think we talked about this back in episode 95, about how the Carboniferous Rainforest ultimately collapsed, and it, ecosystems went haywire a little bit. It was an extinction event. It was bad for everybody involved. <laughs> yes, this is what happens when you have, like, a super biome. <laughs> that wasn't prepared uh, when when things went bad, and that like that really had a, a huge impact on the like on terrestrial environments. Like that was such a fundamental part of the world, and so when it went away, like you have this pretty fundamental restructuring of the terrestrial biomes. Yeah, like the Permian is a terrible time to be a plant. <laughs> yeah the carboniferous rainforest collapse is responsible for the just the dreaded world that was the permian i just think like i just in my mind's eye i see the permian with like a sepia filter like it's just kind of <laughs> like orange yeah no it's definitely a bit of a noir moment in sad Earth's violins <laughs> yes exactly but uh the reason we like the the reason there was able to be this this diversification diversification of the upland flora is like away from this these beautiful swamps you saw around the equator is because the rainforest collapsed. It's like okay, this is our time to shine. We were up north getting swole. Like I guess we're gonna <laughs> show everybody how good we are at being biomes. 
But uh, if you bring it a little bit closer to today, I mean, just think about the mammoth steppes. Like, there used mm-hmm. to be these these grasslands that probably very similar today, but also had these grass grassland uh, ecosystem engineers. So basically, it is the... I can't say temperate, because they're not temperate. <laughs> the... the um, the cold temperature equivalent of, say, African savannas. Um, that really doesn't right. exist today. You know, you do have some ecosystem engineering done by, um, say, bison and the like. But, like, dude, they're not mammoths. <laughs> yeah. So this is something that during the Pleistocene, right, the Ice Age, very, you know, within the last couple million years, we had these grassland biomes all spread all across the Northern Hemisphere that are unlike what we see today, right? That is an extinct biome, highly diverse. We talked about this mm-hmm. in the last episode, 114. Highly diverse, cold climate, grassland biome, which, if I've heard Ali correctly here, were influenced largely, dramatically, and importantly, not only by plants, Ali. Yes, <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> But by, and I think, I think this really speaks, we've talked about this before, episode 66, we talked about this. One of the things that impresses me most about animals like mammoths is you do not have proboscideans, elephants living in an ecosystem without fundamentally changing the ecosystem. Yeah, there's a reason that some groups of animals we call environmental engineers, because when you put an elephant or a beaver, which are very different ends of the spectrum, but when you put them somewhere, they change what habitat (laughs) they are living in. And to that point, Allie mentioned at the start of this episode that biomes are named for plants, usually. The mammoth step <laughs> yeah. is named for its animals, which is really, really cool. Like that's that's a, a an unusual feature for a biome. Yeah, that's the only like that's the only example I can think of off the top of my head. And honestly, like full disclosure, I thought I was gonna study proboscideans when I started off in paleontology. So like I can't be mad <laughs> that it was a mammoth. They're, they're pretty similar to trees. Yeah, I was about to say, like <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. That is very like I mean their feet are ba- basically like, they're like are basically tree trunks but yeah there are (laughs) head through time yes like you have seen the extinction of of uh biomes like for example the the, literally the first biome the kind of like we just got moss yo that is definitely gone and i I don't know what kind of ripples that left behind honestly i mean forest happens so i i think i think we're okay (laughs) But it is a little bit different when you are looking back at something that is so recent. Like, we just missed it. Like, geologically, we just missed a mammoth step. Yeah. Well, and the mammoth step disappears at around the same time that we see what we discussed in episode 25, the Pleistocene megafaunal extinction. And part of that is because of the extinction, right? You lose mammoths, you lose the mammoth step. But also you lose the mammoth step and you start losing a lot of the things that relied upon the mammoth step to survive. Yep. This made, this made me think of a, a question about losing biomes is, so there are, there are certain biomes that cannot exist if certain global conditions are, are not right. Like, like the tundra yeah. needs to be a cold, dry grassland. So if it's not cold enough, you can't really have a tundra because like, during the Cretaceous, the poles were forested. Yeah, right. They were polar forests, which is another biome on it, yeah. probably. That, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Like, there is nothing like that today. A forest that has six months of darkness? Yep. Yeah. So, like, and, like, losing that makes sense. Uh, but if we were to come back around and the Earth were to warm up enough again that we got polar forests again, are polar forests extinct or are they just not around right now? I'm glad you asked this question. Like I was going to ask this yeah. question. Can a <laughs> biome come back after it has gone extinct around the globe? Or would we define that differently? Okay. Oh, I love these kinds of questions. Okay. <laughs> I... Yeah. So is this like, is this a new biome or is this like a Lazarus biome? Yes. Right. Ooh, okay. I think that... At that point, the determining factor as to whether is this come back or is this new is going to then be community composition. 
So I think what lives there? who is making it, um, because that's really going to decide how it works um, fundamentally. So for example, like the Carboniferous rainforest and the modern rainforest, both rainforests, but that is not a Lazarus like biome. Yeah. This, this is a fundamentally- right. Those were- Yeah. Those different were, plants exactly those were pro gymnosperms and seed ferns it's just lots of weird things versus today they're dominated by angiosperms so right for example if so i guess it depends on the time scale we're looking at like if it happens oh goodness gracious soon <laughs> it might well be a case of it just coming back because if it's dominated by angiosperms, they were in, say, you know, the Paleocene and in the Cretaceous, they were, well, no, they weren't. In the Paleocene, you did have a lot of gym, or a lot of angiosperms. I don't know about the polar forests of the Cretaceous. So yeah, I'm not sure. And who knows, maybe ferns are going to like get their act together. And oh, I got it. If you have like, an Antarctic, like, tree fern dominated polar forest, that would be a novel, like, that would be a new biome. And mm-hmm. I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine that this would, it, it's an even easier question if you think of something like deserts. Yeah. Like, if for some strange reason all the deserts disappeared, mm-hmm. I imagine it wouldn't take much for us to classify something taking on a desert like form as a desert. Because that is defined in in a lot of ways by the absence mm-hmm. well, of a lot of that plant life, right? And we do, and I mean, we call rainforest rainforest in the Carboniferous and today. Um, but I do wonder, like, if we had a desert, you know, deserts went extinct, which I really don't. that that one's pretty resilient. We've had deserts yeah, for a yeah. very long time, <laughs> um, but if for whatever reason we went to like I don't no water world and then like came yes. back yeah like un- unless it was a fundamental shift to like all right gymnosperms it's our time right right like it's probably still a desert well i wonder if it, it would just end up being that we define it like the carboniferous rainforest where it becomes the holocene polar forests yes like, you know it's they're, they're polar forests but those were the cretaceous this is the holocene they're similar they may be very similar but you know 65 million years has passed yes in between them they're not the same so we're not gonna treat them as the same like if if things warm up and we lose all the tundras and then they you know we cool down way in the future again we might get tundra like things but they might be different enough to still get a caveat name yeah well this this brings me into the last big question that i wanted to ask you ali in this discussion if if a biome can go extinct, it stands to reason that a biome can be endangered. Yes. Do we have endangered biomes today? Yes. And just like Will was saying that like the, the tundra, the taiga, like these are endangered. But one that might be overlooked are alpine because... Hmm. Oh. oh, for the same reason. For the exact same reason, because... You know, tundra and taiga, like you're just moving north or south or whatever. That gives you a little bit more wiggle room. If if you get to the top of the mountain, you're out of luck. Like <laughs> So an alpine forest, an alpine biome is high altitude up on a mountain. Yes. And climate up there is different. Yeah. And so as things warm, that that warming climate that the higher temperatures are going to travel up the mountain pushing that biome into a space that doesn't exist. Yes, exactly. And that is actually something that's happening where you live. Here in Tennessee? Yeah, because the Appalachian Mountains are, like, they're so old, so they're not that tall anymore. But (laughs) um, they are still, they're they're still mountains. (laughs) Like, they're still mountains. So... I was in a different department than you <laughs> during our master. Yep. <laughs> uh, I was technically in the biology department. Fun fact. So I had a friend in the biology department, I swear, at least one, who studied <laughs> a population of northern sawwet owls that lived in the Appalachian Mountains. So it was a Ice Age refugia that it was living in. 
So basically, it got instead of when the temperatures changed at the as the temperatures were rising at the end of the Pleistocene, instead of heading north, they went up. So they're on top of the mountains, and and the Appalachian Mountains aren't that tall. So like they're gonna run out of space. You can only go up so far. Exactly, and that's like. That is something that has happened in other parts of the country, too, with these, like, ice age refugia, these these things that got stuck and now can't move. There is a population, I love this, there is a population of maple trees in Texas. Lost Maples State Park. There were maples, <laughs> I know, right? There were maples uh, that made it to Texas during the last ice age. And then as the temperatures rose, these maples made it into basically, um, like, canyons kind of um so they're they're hidden in these pockets of cool temperatures they're not happy maples but they're living there but they may be out of luck fairly soon but even separate from that in in addition to changing temperatures you've got rising sea level and so that's going to impact coastal ecosystems so you know, the mangroves, for example, like if they get fully inundated, they're, they're still trees. And also humans have a tendency to drain wetlands. Yep. yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When we, when I asked about endangered biomes, my first thought was mangroves. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, they, they face so many issues, uh, due to our own human activities. Yay. Exactly. Exactly. So, but who knows? Like, maybe, maybe, oh, I don't even want to think about it. Like, who knows? Maybe we wipe things out and then they might come back. <laughs> and new and better. Long in the future. <laughs> then we the won't the see new it. mangroves. Yes, mangroves 2.0. <laughs> well, Allie, this has been a fascinating discussion. I, I'm glad I, I've learned a bunch about biomes. I'm oh, glad yeah. you finally got to talk about this topic that I know you've been wanting to talk about. Yes. Hopefully our listeners have also enjoyed it. I think this is the kind of episode that lays the foundation for us to talk more about different biomes in the future and kind of puts into perspective a lot of the changes through time that we've discussed on the podcast, not only in episodes with you, but on episode, you know, this comes up in the news all the time. Yeah. Right. The way that ecosystems and environments change over time. Before we wrap things up. We have a patron question. We do. One of the things that our patrons are able to do if they subscribe on our Patreon at a certain level is to submit questions to be answered on the podcast. And I was looking through our list of patron questions and wouldn't you know it, we had a question about a biome. Thanks, patrons. So just a, a fantastic opportunity. What, what a perfect episode to bring this up. Allie, this is a question that hopefully you will be able to answer. As our guest, Brian asks, how long has the temperate rainforest biome been in existence in the Pacific Northwest and nearby? Because most of that area was glaciated in the past, where did the flora and fauna come from? And do you know what kind of animals lived in the original temperate rainforest? All right. I got very excited about this question because I realized I didn't know anything about that half of the continent in terms of glaciation. I know the Laurentide ice ice sheet. I'm from Michigan. Like I'm abundantly aware of ice sheets. So (laughs) fun fact, uh, the Pacific Northwest was under a different ice sheet. The Cordilleran ice sheet did not know that. I (laughs) super excited about that. Um, So it's important to note that the Pacific Northwest was not glaciated as extensively as, say, the Great Lakes region. That was inundated and just covered with ice. However, there definitely was ice. Um, there was ice there until 10, 12,000 years ago. Okay. Which means that... So yeah, roughly 12,000 years ago. Which means that you don't really see the beginnings of the temperate rainforest that we know today until roughly 10,000 years ago. Um, A little bit more, a little bit more recently. Basically it has looked like this for roughly 2000 years, which really is not that long. No. So we're talking Pacific Northwest for anyone. You know, we have international listeners. Yeah. 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 We are talking the Northwest chunk of uh, North America. Yes. Right, up in the Washington, southwestern Canada, that region. Yes. 
yeah, being so, the Pacific Northwest. So like, uh, British Columbia, Vancouver, um, Washington State, Oregon, that, that part of the world. Right. Yeah. So the it was glaci- glaciated until roughly 12,000 years ago. And then you have the, the inklings of like uh, these this flora. And then roughly two, by 2,000 years ago, it, it's looking pretty pretty much like we see today. And this is mostly from a uh, pollen record, which is fan- fantastic. These are the kinds of things you could do when you were working more recently. The work that I found when I was looking into this suggested that these, uh, yeah, suggested that these plants were coming from further inland. So we're coming from like Idaho, that that sort of area. So fairly local, but a little bit further from the actual glaciation. I am not willing or able to talk about the animals. No idea what kind of <laughs> animals there were. I'm sure they existed. But yeah, I did not realize that the uh, the temperate rainforests were actually super young. And I, I learned so much with this question. So I hope that that uh, is a satisfactory answer. That's very cool. Well, and it, it really ties into what we were talking about before, about how changes to the landscape and changes to the climate can allow your biomes to move around. Because, yeah, there was ice there, like just a big old chunk of ice that meant your forests could not grow in that space. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you, Brian, for asking that question. Thank you to everyone who requested this topic. Thank you to all of our patrons and to all of our listeners. And above all else, this episode, thank you to Allie for joining us again. Yeah. I'm so happy to be here. I love doing this. I like (laughs) y'all. Well, we feel the same. We are always excited to have you come on and teach us a bunch of stuff we didn't know. And we will be excited to welcome you back again in another 10 episodes for the next episode episode that ends with the number five episode 125 will be another plant related topic with Allie. so listeners if you haven't already submit your plant related topic requests and we will scour that list in a few months and see what we want to have Allie tell us about next time until then as always there will be a blog post after this episode that you can check out for more pictures and links for more information Send in your requests, comments, questions, things like that. Find us on the social medias. It is June, which means that shortly after this episode comes out, we will start releasing this month's double feature of Silver Screen Science. Absolutely. Keep your ears open for us talking about some movies. We release new episodes every fortnight. Many more episodes and many more fortnights to come. I think that's everything I have to say. Yeah, sounds pretty good. I'm a little distracted because the cat started moving around. I'm holding her right now. No one out there in the in the in the listening world knows that there's a cat here on the podcast it's, right it's, now. It's, it's so she's being cute. good. It's so cute. She is very cute and and very restless after sitting here very politely for the whole episode. Yeah, good man, job, listeners. If you could see her, you'd appreciate it so much. She's oh man, she's just so cute. Oh, she's so doing cute. this thing with her paws. It's such very a shame. Cute. Oh, you really you really should have been here, Allie. Thank you one more time. We will have you back again soon maybe even sooner than our listeners think oh. <laughs> but that's all i'm gonna say about that let's end the episode bye everybody bye bye thanks for listening to the common descent podcast You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.